Welcome everyone to this first session of our webinar series on why gender matters for immunization. Before we start, please note that this webinar is being recorded and a link to the video as well as the presentation will be shared by email to everyone who registered after the webinar session. During this session, Feel free to ask your questions to our panelists by typing them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be answered during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This webinar is interpreted in French. In order to listen to French language, please click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and select French language. Feel free to mute the original audio in order to listen to the interpreter only. I am now going to give the floor to Stephanie Schendel from WHO, who will introduce the webinar and the presenters. Stephanie, over to you. Thank you, Gigi, and hello, everybody, and welcome to our very first webinar in this uh, short webinar series on why gender matters for immunization. Um, I'm going to start with a really brief overview of the webinar series. Um, for those of you who haven't already seen this post for many times through the registration, we're going to be having five sessions um, in this series. They will provide a brief overview of the Why Gender Matters guidance document, which is a joint, present, uh, joint publication between WHO Gavi and UNICEF um, that covers why gender is important to consider for immunization programs. Um, and so that will be the theme of this webinar series. Uh, we're going to spend the next few weeks covering off um, a couple of the, the topics that are covered in this guidance document in um, at a closer look. So as I said, today will be the overview. And then for the next few weeks following this, each session will go into a little bit deeper content uh, on one of the suggested ways of better addressing gender considerations through your immunization programming. And each session following today will also feature some country examples of how these concepts have been applied in practice and sharing some of the positive lessons learned um, and um, positive examples of uh, gender responsive programming that we are seeing through our country programs. So today, as I said, will be an introduction. I'm joined today with my colleagues uh, Shub uh, Shubo Jalal, who's a senior gender specialist at UNICEF, and Jean Monroe, the senior manager for gender at Gavi. I myself am a technical officer at WHO in Geneva in the life course and integration team within the immunization vaccines and biologicals department. So we'll start off today um, without further ado, because we have a lot of material to cover. And I do wanna make sure that we have enough time at the end of the session today to address some questions um, and share some experiences from those who are in the audience with us today. So please do share in the chat who you are, where you're from, and of course, feel free during the course of this presentation to share any thoughts um, of how this connects to the work that you are involved in or your experiences in the chat. And as Gigi said, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box so that we can make sure that we address them at the end of the presentation. So today we will cover uh, very briefly why gender matters for immunization. Um, setting the scene for this whole uh, webinar series. Uh, we'll look a little bit closer at understanding gender-related barriers that impact immunization, talk very, very briefly about gender analysis and sources of data that you can find um, oftentimes already available within your countries, and we will go over that at a really light touch because we have a dedicated session on that uh, at the second webinar coming up. We will then talk about some of the gender responsive approaches that are suggested in the Why Gender Matters guide, um, followed by some a few slides on resources, and then we'll go into Q&A. So just before we get started, I want to touch on this because gender and sex are often incorrectly conflated. And I just want to set the scene by ensuring that everyone on the call today 
as referring to these concepts in, in the same way. And so while sex and gender are two things that, that very much interact, they are distinct and they shouldn't be used interchangeably. So sex refers to a biological attributes. It's a biological characteristic, uh, mainly associated with physical and physiological features, chromosomes, gene expression, hormone levels and function, reproductive and sexual anatomy. Whereas gender is a social construct. Um, it talks about the roles and relations between men, women, girls, boys, gender diverse people, um, including people with non-binary gender identities. And so gender as a concept and as a construct varies from society to society and it can evolve over time. It's also as a social construct hierarchical and it often reflects the unequal power dimensions and can produce the inequalities that intersect and compound with other social and economic inequalities. So these are separate. We wanna make sure that when we're talking about things like gender equity, gender equality, that we're understanding the difference between sex and gender. And so with that in mind, I wanna consider the often cited uh, statement that immunization is widely perceived as a gender neutral intervention because global studies have not found major discrepancies in coverage between boys and girls. But this does not tell us the whole story. First of all, global averages, as we know, even national averages lie in the sense that they hide the details that are underneath the surface. We're often missing information um, that we would get from disaggregated data. And in some places, this is where this, these discrepancies actually can show up. And so this is a reason why it's important to promote uh, the collection, systematic collection of data broken down by various characteristics, including sex, but also disaggregated by other things like location, socioeconomic background, disability, ethnicity, uh, because this is where the, the details lie. And without having that kind of granularity, we actually don't really know whether there are these types of discrepancies at lower levels and therefore cannot formulate the gender responsive actions that might be needed in some cases. But again, we're going to talk a lot more about this in next webinar um, in two weeks time. Uh, so I won't dwell on it too much. But I also just want to say that second of all, and perhaps more importantly, focusing only on coverage discrepancies actually entirely misses the point about those who are not being vaccinated at all and the reasons behind that. And so this is where the question about uh, gender barriers to immunization really can become quite important because we do know that subnational analysis do show that communities where overall coverage is lower, so where, for example, zero dose communities or communities where we have higher numbers of zero dose children are associated with communities where there's higher levels of gender inequality. So these concepts are related in that sense. It's really about who's not being reached by vaccination services and why that is and what those potential gender related barriers might be that are impacting this. So to summarize, this is not only an issue of coverage between girls and boys, it is really about recognizing and, their, and then responding to the gender related barriers to access and uptake and to overall improve immunization coverage for everyone. So where does this fit within the IA 2030? Um, the title of the guidance document on which this webinar series is based is Why Gender Matters for IA 2030. And this is because IA 2030 in and of itself is aiming to reach everyone everywhere at every age with the full benefit of vaccines to improve health and well-being. And that of course means addressing and advancing gender equality. Gender equity issues is obviously right at the heart of strategic priority three of the IA2030 on coverage and equity, but it is a really important cross-cutting consideration for all of the seven strategic priorities of IA2030. And so what we're doing is aiming to adopt a gender mainstreaming across all of our immunization programming to better understand and address the barriers to immunization services. Um, and so it's also reflected very clearly in all of the four IA2030 core principles, people-focused, country-owned, partnership-based, data-guided, 
the idea of gender mainstreaming is that gender considerations should be taken into consideration all the way across the board. And so you can find this, these concepts woven throughout the IA2030 strategic document and where it fits into all of these four core principles is covered in a lot more detail in the Why Gender Matters Guide. But what does it mean to adopt a gender mainstreaming approach? Gender mainstreaming is not the goal and of itself, but it is the entire process. It is the strategy. It is the journey, uh, if you could think about it like that. And what it means is just making systematic efforts to apply the knowledge of gender all the way across any planned action, um, not only for immunization, but in general, starting all the way from the policy legislation pieces through the programmatic actions in all areas and at all levels. And so this should be undertaken, as I said, at policy level, institution, organization level, and at the level of the program or project themselves. And it's based on seven principles of gender mainstreaming. Again, I know this is a busy slide, but I just want to throw it out there to show that this is the framework um, with which we can think about this. And again, this is covered in a lot more detail in the Why Gender Matters Guide. So please do go and take a look at that document for more detail, detail on this whole idea of uh, seven principles to gender mainstreaming. Sorry, Stephanie, just before you go on, I yes. think some people have not been able to get to interpretation. Oh, so sorry, I can't see the... For those who are looking for interpretation in French, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see uh, interpretation. So you press on that and then it will be in French. Thank you so much, Jean. I have my screen in full projection mode, so I cannot see the, the chat. Okay, please do flag it up if you still have uh, issues getting there. Okay, so hopefully we're all together now en français aussi. Um, and so I just want to say one more point before handing it over to Shubo, that is just as gender mainstreaming um, should be thought about at all levels of any planned action, we also should be thinking about gender related barriers at multiple levels, because these barriers do operate from the policy and structural levels around how health systems are designed and implemented, and all the way down from the community to the household to the individual level. And gender barriers absolutely do affect individuals of all genders. Gender relations, gender um, conversations is not only synonymous with women and girls issues. This is about gender equality for everyone of all genders. But this is often underpinned by power relations. And so it often is especially pronounced for women and girls. And in terms of immunization programs, gender barriers can affect both the supply and the demand size of the coin. So from the way that services are provided um, and delivered, as well as impacting the behavior and social drivers side of demand as well, the health seeking behaviors of communities and of individuals. And so to talk about this in a little bit more detail, I'm going to now hand it over to Shubo to take us through the next section. Shubo, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you for joining this webinar. So we want to continue on that and take that overview into our own programming. So what does that mean in terms of doing gender analysis and understanding the context in a better way? If you go to the left side of this, we're talking about poor quality service. That's one thing. So our service is not accommodating the different needs, the different barriers, the different uh, um, uh, um, requirements to be effective enough for the population. When you go towards that low education level, that's one thing. So knowing the importance of vaccine is something. So that's, that's the health literacy around immunization. But even if people know the importance of vaccine, then the important other thing is to decide to take their children to vaccination, whether a, a father or a mother, we're talking about the decision, who is making that decision to take that. Even if you know and you have the decision and you want to decide to, then there is the other issue is, do I have the resources to take my child to the immunization? 
So the lack of access to resources is a different level of barrier. When you all have that, but then you also in working in an environment where you're, yourself as a father and mother are subject to violence and uh, risks and other things, that makes you hesitate to take the child to immunization. So we're gonna unpack these areas and see how this can affect our program. Next slide. In terms of the poor quality, and most of you have been working in the field of health and immunization and community health, and you can see that there is definitely an issue with the healthcare provider. Sometimes they are not aware of the gender barriers and hence they are not conveying the right message in the right way to be accommodating that barrier. So poor working condition could be one thing, but who in disrespectful treatment, sometimes we have a young mother disrespected. Sometimes we have a single mother disrespected. Sometimes we have a mother with HIV disrespected or treated in a different way, which makes that mother think twice before coming back to the next immunization session. And a lot of times we can see from the field that when the mother comes without the card, she's like kind of, there is bullying, there is harassment. Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you, why didn't you care for your child? So all of those, sometimes not intentional, but it comes with the behavior of the health workforce that makes the, the, the parent that's coming to take those services hesitant to come again for that one. So it is really important to know that. And when we unpack the behavior of the health workforce, we can see that the community health workforce are really overloaded. You can count. It's maternal health, it's child health, it's a nutrition, it's communication, it's the community, um, non-communicable diseases, it's a mental health, a lot of programs, a lot of burden, and sometimes underpaid or paid uh, um, uh, not adequately. So that all has an implication of how they are um, behaving and that has implication on the service and how the service is perceived by the care, uh, caregiver, uh, the parents. Sometimes we don't have female health workforce and in cultures where this is matter, um, um, important matter for the families and the, the norms in that community, that makes a big barrier because the role of the mother in those cultures is the one responsible on immunization and having services provided by a different sex is, is something, a barrier for that service. Disability, physical and cognitive compound gender barriers uh, in most cases we see in every single development indicator, we see disabled are more disadvantaged than normal people. So having that mindful within the health system to know these barriers and to address them, these are something that we need to talk about. When we come, next slide, when we come to the health literacy, we, we have a global evidence saying that young mothers without education are less likely to have access to health services and are less likely to have access to, uh, to the information at the same time. So it is really important. And when the information is given, it's important to see if it is reaching, if it is comprehended, if it is at the level of understanding of those mothers. So this is also another value. We had, um, when we were in Ghana dis uh, dis uh, discussing the barriers and we said, which vaccine are you coming now for? She just said, I don't know. They don't, they are not aware of the importance of vaccine. They are not aware of the schedules because of the, they don't have the adequate health literacy around the subject, which can be a barrier for those who are not willing to come to vaccination. Next slide. We said about household level decision-making. It is really important. If this is the grandmother that's deciding who goes for immunization, your whole program targeting fathers and mothers will not work because it is the grandmother decision making. And within the household level, sometimes it's the mother, sometimes it's the father, sometimes it is joint. We need to know that because that power determines whether that child is going to be immunized, immunized or not immunized. And when we're talking about female headed household or we're talking about who is the um, able to, to influence the decision. 
uh, it is really important. Why we are talking about this important thing? It's a household level, but at the same time for us as a programmer, it is really important. When we say we need to have a skills building program, empowerment program, it is the empowerment that give them, for example, a young mother, a, um, 17 or 18 mother, uh, um, may not be able to negotiate. So skills building empowerment program will be important to be able to empower that woman and act, uh, and make her able to negotiate the decision at household level. When we go for the next slide, when we go for the um, uh, lack of access to resources, in many contexts, women are overburdened with domestic work, fetching water, caring for elderly, cooking, washing, doing everything. So you're asking that mother or yet that family, and of course, adding to that is immunization is their role and responsibility. In some context, and in fact, right now in the context of the drought in Africa, the, the evidence tell us that the time to fetch water has doubled in some countries and in some localities because of the drought. So imagine a mother, and in some context, they say that they, they're taking more than one hour to go and fetch water. Imagine one hour to go and come, and then you're asking her, can you come again for, for immunization? So knowing the, um, the burden, that's one thing, and that's the time in which we are talking about resources. Transportation is a big issue. Sometimes it costs time, and sometimes it costs money. And when you are asking, you need to put that in mind to be able to decide on behalf of the mother, I'm going, am I going to immunize or not going to immunize? And at the same time, uh, these are all resources that we are talking about. And I would like to also add the resources in terms of the access to, um, uh, access to technology and other things. Um, yeah, we, 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 we sometimes do a lot of things. The COVID is an example. We have bombarded the social media with a lot of messages, but it's those those mothers who are not able to connect, who do not have digital access, who do not have digital literacy, um, are the ones not coming for immunization. So did our message go to them? Did our message reach them? That's the question I want to pose for you to have. Next slide. Child marriage. In fact, they say that the brain is not well developed, so comprehension of the mother is not well. Uh, being able to fulfill uh, things, it will not be adequate. And that affects how the environment within the household. And if I'm not as a program, and if I'm not aware of that as a barrier, and I not accommodate those needs, then I'm not doing my work in the right way. The same time, we have seen some evidence where it says if there is a long waiting time at the facility and the mother is late on her other household chorus work, then that's a risk for a violence of, at the household level. So a lot of things that goes beyond the minds of the mothers and fathers before they come to our uh, facility. And that's where we need to kind of be able to, that, to do that. Sometimes we have also um, uh, for example, in one context, there's harassment on the street, huh? and it's a big one because if I am in a conservative environment, then I'm not able to kind of give the permission to or to uh, allow my wife or my daughter to be able to be subjected to harassment. So when we talk about environment violence, we need to kind of uh, know that. Son of preference is also another form. We have an example of maternal death in, in, in Palestine because she knew she had a heart problem. She knew she, had, uh, she will be at risk, but um, she took the risk to get a boy because that's what her surrounding asked her to do, and that's what caused her death. So we do have elements that are at the community level, which we as a programmer need to think of in order to be able to deliver our programs. So what does that tell us? Let's go to the next slide. We need to bring this all to our structure. I mean, we, I cannot be sitting in my office and decide, okay, in my community, 
the mobility is the barrier, or in my community, uh, the, the transportation is a barrier, or the, uh, the security is a barrier. These are things that we need to put them in a structure. And as Stephanie has rightly said, the barriers can cut across at different levels, and we need to mind, be mindful of that. When we're talking about the program of immunization in a context where three out of the four mothers are adolescent mothers, I need to program my mind in a way to address that while I'm responding to the needs of immunization. Shall I be also coordinating with my protection teams or my protection uh, uh, ministry to be able to look into those child marriage policies and things? Is that something that can I can advocate for? Not necessarily to do the program. I am a health programmer. I may not be able to influence, but I can certainly advocate for that. When we're talking about policy issues of transportation, is it something that I can do to advocate for when we're talking about uh, access to water? Is it something that I can coordinate with the other sectors? Multi-level and multi-sectoral content. These are issues that are talk we are talking about in terms of the policies. But also within the health policies, we have health policies themselves. Do we have family-friendly policies for the mothers who are um, uh, for the female health workforce? Do we have good payment? We have adequate and fair payment. Do we have uh, uh, maternity leave? These are all issues in my own system within the health policies that I can influence to make sure that I am getting the right services. At the same time, you can see on the, uh, these are the structural barriers, the time of the vaccination, the schedule of the vaccination. These are all issues that related in terms of the structural and the social. So you can compile all this information in a structure. This not, all, not only helping us to define the level of the barrier, sometimes we have barriers across all levels. Then it's my turn as a programmer where do I prioritize? How do I address this issue? Which, which barrier I should be taking? And this is what some suggestions we will hear from the intervention from the later slide that uh, Jean is going to lead. So it is really important to put the analysis in the context of the barriers. And this is socio-ecological models that we are proposing and which covers all the positives. Uh, all the levels. And it actually takes you through uh, Fatima and Eddie's life. Huh? So at this green circle, you can see Fatima and Eddie. If they want to be, if we want Fatima and Eddie to be vaccinated, we really need to their, their parents, their household level. We need their community to be accommodating and promoting. Sometimes communities are actually a barrier for movement in, in Pakistan and Afghanistan. What we saw is the community saying for the health worker, why are you outside? The female health worker, why are you outside? Why You should be at home. So the, the community sometimes can be a barrier for immunization. This is one, and the second one is also the trust of the community with the health system. These are all implication. Even if I am a father and a mother willingly and in, entirely convinced of immunization, if I go out for immunization and I see my neighbor discriminating me for that, then I will hesitate twice to go for that. So this slide gives us the, con the framework where we put all the analysis components into one level, one uh, uh, structure, and then define the priorities that I can work around it in my programs. Do I have another slide? Yeah. I think we went through this. We, we need to know the import information and then we know how to in influence uh, the program. I wanted to take you through this slide which says, so if I done the gender analysis for my community and I didn't see a gender in terms of 50% vaccinated boys and girls, so there, there's no difference in that. But I want you to know if there is like, for the last two years, we only witnessed that measles vaccination is 70%, 70%, 70%. For that 30% who are not immunized, is there a gender background for that? So if my analysis tell me there is a gender background for that, I need to do tailored programming. And that's the first side of it. If there is no gender gap, then what do I do? As a programmer, I need to ensure that I am reaching the 50% boys and girls. I need to ensure that I am not enforcing a stereotype. For example, um, we have seen that a lot of um, sessions, like 90% of the session participants were mothers. 
is that right? If I am enforcing that, then I need to kind of look into my approaches of a programming. Am I doing it equitably? But if there is also no, I don't know if there is a gap, then I need to think and I need to put in my plan, I need to do a gender analysis. I need to do evidence to be able to be deciding on what kind of programs I need to perform. I think that's it from my side. Um, I hope I didn't take, oh yeah. This is another slide, heavy one, but I'm just going to go through it very quickly. We also need the gender analysis because it is, it tells us how to do the program. If I am in a community and they, I know that there are pregnant, lactating, uh, migrant, uh, uh, non-registered births, I need to program differently. If I am in a community where there is a different role for fathers and mother, I need to know that so that I can schedule my time, I can do my vaccination session in a time that is convenient to those roles and which can be uh, uh, by both fathers and mothers. If I know the education level, the resources they have, like the technology I mentioned, my program needs to be also accommodated to be able to do that. If I know that there is a security risk in Haiti, one of the big things is the security. It's not the economic, it's not the decision-making, it's not the empowerment, it's the security. So how I design my program in that context is completely different than a context which is safe and secure. I need to know those barriers to be able. Practices is really important. Media practices is really important. If I am airing my, my messages across the TV in um, 8 p.m. time or news time, Imagine who's going to watch that. You have to know the media preference of the fathers and mother. If I am targeting them, if I am targeting the grandmother, which media channel I should be using? Is it the face-to-face? -face? Is it the radio? Is it the TV? Is it the internet? I need to know those to be able to program my demise. And the same time, the risk, if there is any risk I am posing on if through my program or there's a risk before they come to my program, I need to be mindful so that I can tailor my program. And of course, when we're looking into all these things, please, 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 I, I really emphasize the point, look at opportunities, because sometimes the opportunities gives you the entry point for your solutions. So different needs from a gender perspective can inform different program aspects, and that's what I wanted to, uh, to tell you through this slide. I think that's the final one. Now, doing the gender analysis, we actually have um, to collect the data. From where do we get, collect the time, data? So we do have a lot of, as you saw, huh? we have policy level, we have service level, we have community level, we have individual level. And what resources do we have across those levels? So we have statistical data at uh, a national level that can give us. Is you can have the publication studies uh, from different UN, academia, NGOs. You can have uh, ministry papers. You can have a national gender strategy that could inform how we move forward. So we can definitely have uh, mixed data or DHS data, or we have uh, uh, at individual levels conducted KAPs or behavioral insight studies. So we have a lot actually of resources. We can go through those ones. And if there is not, then we still have the, form, uh, the qualitative type of data that could help you at a local level. If I am working, I know that my zero dose community is in this locality. I need to go to that locality and collect some data, whether it is a qualitative focus group discussion, key informant that can help me in terms of deciding what areas that I want to take. Um, social listening, observation. Sometimes I do go to the environment and just I find myself, ah, so you see they are gathering in this place. Next time I plan my session in that place. Oh, oh, this is a marketplace. Who's in the market? Ah, fathers are in the market. Then I, so observation can also tell us a lot in terms of uh, the information gathering. Yeah. That's it from my side. Uh, I took you through the journey of barriers. I hope that will be clear. I think we will have the webinar next webinar on the analysis, which takes you into a practical example from a country and will 
kind of help you more to kind of relate that to your own context. And as Stephanie mentioned, it is context specific. So while we're talking about this, it completely can be different from country to country. Um, once we do the analysis, we need to do the programming. We do not do analysis for the sake of analysis. We need to do the analysis to inform programming. And here I give it to Jean to take us through the uh, responsive approaches. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Shobo, for um, that overview and really rich discussion of the of, of country examples of the types of barriers. Um, so I'm gonna be speaking about once these barriers are identified, how do we move towards identifying the right interventions to, to address them? And you'll see in front of you uh, what we call the gender continuum. And it can be used in, it's, it's not a, a global health initiative. We can use that in any kind of international development programming or any programming. On the far left-hand side, we have something called gender harmful or gender unequal. And it goes all the way to the right-hand side to be gender transformative. And we use this continuum to really think um, quite systematically about what is the intention behind the intervention that we want to design. Uh, we can also use it as an assessment as well of what we have uh, put in place. So um, on the left-hand side, the gender unequal, it's an intervention that would actually perpetuate different types of gender inequities. It could reinforce um, stereotypes and can often privilege men over women and women over, over men. Similarly with gender blind. So those are two types of interventions that we don't ever want to see. And definitely we wouldn't plan for, but unfortunately sometimes um, these do happen. So when you're doing an assessment, it's good to look through this conti continuum lens to see what was the impact of those interventions? On the far right side, this is where we want to see programming. So what we call gender responsive. Um, and different organizations have different names for it. Um, there's uh, UNICEF has a, a, a one type, WHO, CARE, but essentially organizations want to see gender responsive or transformative programming. <clears throat> Um, so gender specific is when there's a, a specific initiative targeted at a group of women or men um, for a particular purpose, but it doesn't necessarily challenge any inequities. Whereas on the transformative side, you would identify the cause of the gender inequality and work towards transforming it. So just to take an example, if you're planning an outreach initiative, um, a way that would be harmful is if it's only men who are at the table designing the program, which would largely be implemented by women and largely for women. But we would perpetuate the idea that men are the main decision makers and the leaders. If you went to a more transformative or responsive side, um, you would have a much more diverse group of people at the design stage. You would understand um, what would bring caregivers to an outreach um, area, what would actually stop them from coming that and create um, approaches that, to overcome those types of barriers. So an example of a transformative one is um, perhaps a community would have some kind of social accountability or scorecard to help um, assess the outreach and, and design the outreach. Um, we would develop and empower women to be part of that process and to have the skills to um, run that kind of social accountability part of the, of the outreach. Uh, next slide. Now Shobo shared some of the types of barriers and these are examples of how to overcome those barriers. And by no means are we saying that these are what you should do. Of course, it has to come from the community and what the community um, needs, but we're just sharing these as examples of um, how these barriers can be responded to. So on the first, where women have limited mobility, time and control over resources, 
um, you can actually bring the vaccines to where women are, are often. Um, so we've heard about initiatives where uh, vaccines are delivered in marketplaces, uh, near watering points, um, near auctions, cattle auctions. Another example is to extend the times um, or, the, or the places of the vaccination services. Again, you need to be thinking very carefully about that because that could put additional stress or burden on the healthcare worker who has to deliver it. Um, but we have seen that that has a direct impact on increase in coverage um, when the hours of services are outside of normal working hours. And of course, being able to provide multiple services. We continually to talk about um, having integrated services. So when a family comes in for services, they can get um, the sexual reproductive health services, nutrition guidance, parenting and immunization, um, at least at the same point in, in service. And this just gives more, um, this is respectful of the caregiver's time. In terms of gender dynamics and decision-making, Shobo you know, highlighted that in many cultures, it's the grandmother who has the ultimate decision. Um, in other cultures, it's men having ultimate decision. Some cultures it's equal, but understanding that and then coming up with the initiatives to address that. Uh, we've seen examples where men or fathers are promoted as, as vaccine champions um, in their communities. Other approaches are to promote male engagement in childcare and joint decision making. In communities where there's a preference for a female um, healthcare worker, uh, a very simple measure, or not simple, of course it's not simple, but is to increase the number of female vaccinators. So hiring, recruiting, training, uh, and making sure they're safe. Um, setting up a hotline for questions dedicated to women. And we saw in for COVID-19 delivery that um, there were specific women-only vaccination sites, which made uh, women feel very much more safe um, and respected uh, to go to such type of vaccination site. Negative service experience and health worker attitudes. We have often heard that um, young unwed uh, mothers coming into health clinics are often shunned. Um, this has you know, multiple impacts. First of all, she won't get her, her children vaccinated. Second, she'll, she won't trust the service and she won't wanna come back for the services. So people have responded to that, or countries have responded by um, training for healthcare workers or having special clinics only for young mothers. Um, in some communities where there's very diverse languages, making sure that all the languages spoken in the communities are also spoken at the health clinic, uh, making it feel much more welcome for everybody. And the last four have been primarily about caregivers, but we really wanna look at the barriers faced by healthcare workers as well. Um, we know that 70% of healthcare is delivered by female health workers, and yet they have very limited role in decision-making. So one of our roles is to ensure to increase representation of women in managerial and decision-making positions. And while they're working to ensure that they're um, their safety is considered uh, in the design of the programs. Now, Shobo introduced us to the socio-ecological framework. There's also um, this framework called the journey to immunization, and it follows the steps that a caregiver will take to, um, to think about, to plan, uh, to journey to, and to have an experience in, and then after the service. And we can look at it from the caregiver's point of view, from the health uh, care worker's point of view, as well as the system. But I'm bringing this up because I think it's important to think about the barriers all along the way, all along that journey, and then the corresponding interventions. So we don't only wanna focus on what's happening at the experience of care, because if we haven't addressed the uh, knowledge, awareness, and belief, or the intent, then the caregiver won't even get to the health, health clinic. 
So I think it's very important once you come up with these barriers, the right intervention, then to map them out along the caregiver journey to make sure that all of the barriers across the journey are addressed. Next slide. So for, for Gavi, um, the Gavi 5.0 strategy, we promote responsive, gender responsive and transformative programming by identifying the barriers faced by the caregiver, the adolescent and the health worker. And we wanna see applications that have gender responsive and transformative interventions included in them. We also want to see uh, an approach where there's women's full and equal participation in the decision making related to health programs and well being. And you'll see in the program funding guidelines, um, when you get the slides, there'll be the link to this, that we've integrated gender throughout all parts of the immunization cycle. So whether it's service delivery, uh, human resources for health, uh, demand generation, different uh, questions to pose to ask what kind of interventions are appropriate for those different areas. And that you'll find in the program funding guidelines. Next slide. And when designing a program, whether it be for Gavi or, or whoever, um, it's important to have a theory of change or a logic table. And this is an excellent resource um, coming from the Immunization and Gender Practical Guide to Integrate a Gender Lens, uh, developed by UNICEF. And I strongly encourage people to, to go to that guide, as well as the IE2030 Why Gender Matters Guide. In this guide, it has a number of um, processes and worksheets to work through to help develop a logic framework like this. So you'll see here at the bottom, it has the structural barriers and what was talking about the types of inputs or the interventions to address them, the expected outcomes, and then you know, our ultimate goal is having fully immunized girls and boys. Next slide. So just to summarize, um, you know, the purpose of this webinar was to give you an, an, an overview and really to underscore why do we want to um, address gender equality in immunization programming? And there's multiple, multiple benefits, you know, empowering women towards gender equal society. If we can do immunization programming in a certain way, we will be able to achieve that. Ultimately, we're working towards increasing immunization coverage for the general public, but also for the really hard to reach clients those who have been historically discriminated against, who are marginalized. If we take a gender lens, there's a, uh, these are key steps to take to be able to identify and reach those groups of people. In addition to improving immunization coverage, it'll improve our overall health outcomes. It can enhance our social accountability and ultimately um, accelerate progress to the sustainable development goals. So, so specifically SDG 5 on gender equality and SDG 3 on better health and well-being. So Stephanie, I'll, I'll pass back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean, and thank you so much, Shubo, um, for those excellent um, presentations, and I'm glad that we do still have enough time to get to Q&A. But before we do, I'll just highlight um, a few resource links that we've shared here. Um, of course, this is the guide that we have all been speaking about, um, where everything that we've covered today is touched upon um, and in more detail as well. Um, so the link is there at the bottom. It's currently available in English and French. We've also shared those links in the chat. Um, it is being produced in Spanish and Portuguese currently, so that will be available um, as soon as possible and uh, will, will be available online when that time comes. The next um, links that we will include, and again, all of these presentations will be shared afterwards, so you'll have all of this. Um, but these are just the landing pages specifically dedicated to gender for each of our three organizations. 
And on those pages are a lot of further reading and useful resources. So rather than try to reproduce them all here on a slide, I just encourage you to go um, onto these links where you can see the resources for yourself. In particular, I want to highlight the immunization, gender, and equity page um, that UNICEF manages. It's the second link on the UNICEF um, list there because that has a resource page that has a ton of helpful links there. So, so please do go. And that is also where the caregiver journey uh, that both Jean and Shubo um, mentioned is, is available for more detail as well. And then just finally, I also want to raise uh, your attention to these three excellent videos on gender and immunization that have been produced by Gabby with the Immunization Academy. And so these are all available in English and French, um, and they are just very short, digestible and fun videos online that cover off a lot of the sort of key topics we've touched on today um, in a really understandable way. And so these can be helpful for in-country trainings or sharing around with any of your other colleagues um, in country as well. So just want to make sure you're all aware of those resources. And so we do still have a few more minutes to quickly go through some questions. Um, thank you so much for your interaction in the chat as well. A lot of good points have been raised there, very interesting from uh, people from various country um, participation. So I'll just start quickly with some excellent questions from Tanya in the chat. So she says, do we have a sense of the relative importance globally of gender-related barriers to vaccination vis-a-vis -vis others? So for example, out-of-pocket payments, transport shortages, policy, or other social determinants like ethnicity, et cetera. So getting into the sort of intersectionality conversation of, um, you know, other, and this is the kind of thing that can, you know, come out when you're doing a gender analysis, because ideally, as Shubo mentioned, you shouldn't, when we're talking about a gender analysis, actually shouldn't only be focusing on gender, but also ideally bringing in some of these other intersectional considerations as well. So this kind of thing might come up in that type of analysis. So I don't know, Shubo, do you have any sense of, uh, through the, the various gender analyses that you guys have been involved in in UNICEF, uh, do you have any idea of how sort of this stacks up vis-a-vis uh, -vis other uh, potential barriers that, that might come up in this sense? Uh, thank you very much. I think this is really a good question. And um, as we said, actually, it's a context specific. I'm not sure if a global picture can give us the right percentages. Is it gender or not gender? Is it gender or um, or poverty? Or is it gender or, or whatever uh, other intersectionality? I'm not sure if there is a global kind of uh, analysis of that because it is really context. Actually, we have seen from our colleague in Pakistan in the chat that it's even within Pakistan, it's different from place to place. So um, not necessarily to have a global picture, but I really encourage you, go back and look at your measles vaccine. If it is 70%, that 30% gap, what is the value? And I really want to, to take into that, if there is a gender barrier for that 30%, that is 10% of that 30% is gender, and you have 5% because of transportation, or, or uh, specifically you're talking about uh, probably another 5% service related, where do you work? Which, which area do you want to focus on? That's, that's how it matters. Depending on your context, what is the weight of the barrier that you need to prioritize in order to improve and reach those 30% that you have missed? I think this also um, uh, kind of brings me to the se your second question, Tanya. Um, I really do not recommend that you go for a, a, a vertical program on gender so that you give the gender component to your gender colleague and you work on immunization as is. That's not the idea. Please avoid that. What we want is you identify the barrier for your immunization program. And when you address it, you address it as part of your immunization program to kind of respond to that. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be like a gender team, um, and I'm gender advisor. So a gender team will work on uh, doing things, empowerment in one, probably in one village, and you're doing your immunization program in another village. Please, please integrate it in your program. Consider it as one of your 
theory of change, as, as Jean was uh, showing us in the slide, it is in your theory of change. And I really strongly recommend that you don't do it a vertical program. It has to be uh, integrated. Thank you, Shubo. And just, um, just to add a little bit to that uh, in relation to Tanya's second question about how far we can go versus gender specific in, in UN programs. I think this also just speaks in general to the importance of partnering with, uh, with other institutions and thinking beyond the immunization space. Uh, we've been talking a lot about this, uh, not just in the gender specific space, but just you know when we're talking about developing national immunization strategies and thinking about how to uh, improve or increase immunization coverage more broadly, bringing in other partners outside of the traditional immunization partners, thinking more about bridging with other sectors, education, um, environment, you know, there's lots of intersections between immunization and health and other um, ongoing ministries and programs in countries. So this is an opportunity to kind of make those connections and, and bridge that um, and see how, you know, different ministries can work together to address some of these sort of more systemic issues, which actually goes into <laughs> the next question also from Tanya, but it's a really good one about, uh, is there a risk in addressing gender, bar gender barriers vertically versus you know, getting at the actual social constructs um, which are underlying this? And this is where the partnership piece is really important. I also think there's some really good learnings from other health programs who have had a lot of experience in um, addressing things where there is a lot of stigma around it. So for example, the HIV uh, programs in countries that have experience in sort of addressing some of these more deeply rooted um, social constructs that can prevent uh, health programs from uh, exercising their uh, their goals well. And so we can we can learn really learn from a lot of programs there too. And if anybody else has experiences with that, please share share that in the chat. Uh, the next question is specifically to Gabby. So Jean, over to you. Can you apply for Gabby funding for women-friendly spaces within organizational premises? Um, yeah, we have seen some examples of that. Um, you know, particularly in, in countries where women want privacy in institutions, uh, whether it's a health clinic or, or where they're working from. Um, so that if we know that that's going to protect women, then it, uh, it does fall within our, um, it would fall within what we support in the program funding guidelines. Thank you. And we have just enough time to address the last question. So Ashley asks, um, this conversation has mentioned caregivers and people seeking services who identify as male or female. Can we speak to how approaches evolve and adapt for communities that may identify differently or challenges that don't align as male-female barriers? So I think that this, again, goes back to the importance of uh, locally tailored data. You know, you, you ideally will find some of these issues when conducting your, um, your research, your gender and intersectional analysis, um, in the particular setting for which you're working. And so the idea is to, you know, come bring those issues to light, understand them, and then adapt and tailor uh, responses appropriately. So if these are the kinds of issues that come up, you are in full control to uh, appropriately design an intervention to address those. But I just want to ask uh, Jean, if you have anything to add to that to elaborate. And then finally, if we have time over to Shubo. No, I, I mean, I think it is a, it's a very difficult issue, particularly in countries um, where it's um, where it's not safe to work on this issue. I think anecdotally, and we have some data to know that those who don't identify as, as male or female um, do experience discrimination when they go into health services. Um, so we know that their children are not getting routine immunization or other health services. Um, so this is, is definitely something to address. Um, we're looking to those in countries to share with us interventions that have been effective um, in order to reach those children who, who don't get the, the services that they need. Shobo, do you have anything to add? Um, I really feel it's a context specific. So in countries where you, are, um, you have laws in the place, completely different than countries where you don't have. When you say, um, maybe you just avoid male and female, you just say father and mother or something that your parents, say. the way you communicate, the way the, the, the guidelines are written in a way different that to accommodate the different uh, 
um, um, context that you have in place. I think that this is a context specific, and as I mentioned, uh, if you have laws on your side, that would be really strong, and you can advocate for uh, to integrate in your standard operating procedures. But if you don't have laws on you, on your side, um, then you try because we're talking about needs, rights. Huh? So you you just avoid the the terminologies in order to be able to kind of reach. Uh, Sometimes we have to be smart in our advocacy to be able to kind of pass something. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And actually, that brings us to time. Um, I am glad that we were able to fit everything into the time. We're going to lose our interpreter now, so we do need to close. But just a reminder that um, if you registered for this session, you will automatically be enrolled in the subsequent ones. So good news for you. But please do consider, uh, please do continue to share this around with your colleagues um, and encourage others to register so that they can participate in the later sessions. All of this material will be shared by email after this for everyone that registered. And there is also a dedicated page on TechNet where all the re webinar recordings, as well as the materials, will be posted afterwards. So we will circulate that as well. It's in the chat, but in case you missed it, we'll circulate it um, along with the, uh, the recordings from this session. Thank you so much to everybody for your participation today. Thank you to Jean and Shubo for your excellent co-facilitation. And I also just want to give a quick shout out to Michaela Mana, who is helping coordinate this whole webinar series behind the scenes. So thank you, Michaela. And we look forward to seeing you all um, on the 22nd of June. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.